Gratitude and Greatness is a production of Recursive Delete Audiovisual. Even with all I know and have learned deep diving into grief, it can still be hard showing up for loved ones who are grieving. So I'm really excited to have discovered Grief Warrior. Sending a Grief Warrior box is a way that friends and loved ones can say, I'm thinking of you and acknowledging your grief. Each box has thoughtfully chosen items, including a journal, anxiety relief essential oil, and so much more. My favorites are the In Morning Badge, letting others know you're in pain without having to say so, and the Ways to Help Notepad, which simplifies asking for help with tasks like laundry or errands without feeling weird for asking for help. The Grief Warrior Box provides healing and comfort, and most importantly, it's a communication from you. Head over to agriefwarrior.com and enter GGG20 for 20% off your purchase of a Grief Warrior box. Check our show notes for more info on Grief Warrior. Grief, Gratitude, and Greatness explores the different ways we grieve, the gratitude that allows us to persevere, and the greatness we discover along the way, one conversation at a time. I'm your host, Sarah Shaul. Coming from a family life that was rife with instability and too much responsibility, Jennifer Jaco was ready to head out in the world and pursue her dreams, including creating a family of her own. But at just 19 years old, she was diagnosed with HIV. It was 1992, and at the time, HIV was not seen as survivable. Doctors told her she would be lucky to live to be 25 years old. Just when she had her whole future ahead of her, she was coming to terms with the news that her life would soon be over, that she would never have a significant loving relationship, and she would never become a mother. Very early into adulthood, Jennifer began grieving a future she thought she would never have. Jennifer turned her grief into activism. Shortly after her diagnosis, she went straight to the Cascade AIDS Project, a nonprofit organization that provides education around HIV prevention and support for those who are HIV positive. She enrolled in their teen peer-to-peer educator program and went on to become a spokesperson for HIV-AIDS in Oregon and across the nation. And an incredible thing happened. Jennifer fell in love, outlived her life expectancy, and at 33 years old, found herself on the cover of Newsweek magazine, showing off her full pregnancy belly. Jen went on to deliver a healthy, HIV-free baby girl. While Jennifer's story appears to be a feel-good, happy one, she continues to grieve, watching her peers lose the battle to the AIDS epidemic, and after 29 years of her advocacy work, the virus continues to spread. When I was growing up, the disease carried the stigma of being specific to populations considered high-risk. IV drug users, and gay men. General ignorance caused us to lose a generation of beloved artists like Freddie Mercury, Easy e and Keith Haring, not to mention the millions of other people whose stories aren't as well known. I was surprised to learn that so many years later, HIV is now back on the rise. Reading articles in the Oregonian and the Willamette Week made me aware of a resurgence of HIV in the homeless population on the West Coast. HIV is making a comeback as a hidden threat, preying on the most vulnerable. The fight and the battle against HIV AIDS has changed markedly over the years. In the early years, it was hard to have organizations, schools allow the education in. There was more stigma, more closure against the message because of what it was associated with. As time has gone on, there's much more of an opening and a welcoming of that information. However, what we have also seen in in terms of that arc is that in the early days, people were much less likely to disclose and talk about it. Today, I see more advocates 
coming out of the woodwork, and it's a beautiful thing. I really appreciate how technology has also moved that forward. I would absolutely say one of the biggest changes in that fight is that we now have this technology that is able to reach people extensively in a way that we could never reach someone. I mean, I started this work in 1992, and think about that was bef really before much emailing, and this was well before any social media. Really, the onset of social media was the mid-2000s. So if institutions and schools were kind of closing their doors to you and your message, what did you have other than email? If you, were, you couldn't go around and speak to people, or you weren't as welcomed back then? Well, one of the ways that we looked at was really reaching people on the ground. And that's still something that's done is intervention in spaces where people live, where people play. And what that means is going to nightclubs, going to places where bands were playing, going to anywhere that people congregate who may be at risk, finding ways at those venues to do those interventions. So I would do things like, you know, when a band is set up and yeah. there's that little bit of time in between bands where it's usually quiet and there's nothing going on. I would get up on stage and do a little bit about having safer sex and using a barrier and protecting yourself and your partner. And then I'd throw out condoms into the crowd. Awesome. <laughs> and so my interventions were much more direct. And I think that even today, those work very well. You know, going into a bar and having that information accessible and available, having a bowl of condoms on the bar top, yeah. those things still work. But back then, that was one of the few ways we could reach people when we couldn't go into an institution or a school. Well, when I had my old shop, the Retread Threads, it must have been someone from the county and would come and we had a bowl at our front register full of condoms. Awesome. And whenever they, whenever I'd call them back up to fill it back up, they just filled it up for free. It was awesome. So I find something really interesting because technology has been really helpful as it's grown to reach more people. But in some ways, a lot of the homeless population, which seems to be where it's concentrated right now. Yes. It seems like it'd be even harder to reach them because they're somewhat unseen. They're seen, but unseen. Exactly. And they're you Not resourced. Even... Yeah. So there's so many more obstacles to a person experiencing houselessness, getting the care that they need. And when we look at that vulnerable population, there are a myriad of factors that are going to make it harder for that person to, number one, get care, and number two, maintain the care that is necessary to keep this virus at bay. The instability of housing the factor of not having a secure place. We've heard about people who've had bottles of medications that are really useless to anyone else, but the medication will get stolen on the off chance that it's something that could be sold or taken. And it's just unfortunate because then that person loses their supply. Sometimes they're not well connected with their care providers. They might not be able to replace that supply quickly. And it just makes it difficult for a person to take the medications that can keep the virus under wraps. How do you reach? So again, that's the on the ground work, really direct intervention, walking into those communities, trying to establish rapport and doing that rather constantly because it's also a very transient and changing population and community. I know that there are people hard at work right now doing that very important and very good work, but it just takes one originator, you know, one person whose virus is not under control and it takes very little to infect, especially if that person is, for instance, sharing needles. And that's why it can spread so very quickly in a, in a small population. All these years later, it's so hard for me to see any kind of resurgence. It's hard for me to see a group of infections occur because it feels like we should be past that. It feels like we know better. We do have the tools. We have access to care. We have medications now that mean that a person like me, I absolutely cannot infect someone else. Mm -hmm. It's impossible because there is no virus in my body that in any of my bodily fluids for me to infect someone. 
That Yay. is huge. Yay. Yay. <laughs> U equals you. Uh, you know, undetectable means untransmittable is what we're really promoting a lot these days. While we know that, while we are at this place where we can control it, we are not taking care of our populations at a level where we can really accomplish that prevention. So if we could give people homes, yeah, provide the social services that individuals need, because there's so many cofactors. A person living with HIV may also be living with many other challenges. And until we can start helping our vulnerable populations, our people who are most at risk for disease progression, we're not going to see this virus stop. Ugh. Basic needs. Mm -hmm. Like if you're hungry and you're cold, you're not going to go looking for meds to address your illness. No. And if you're dealing with a substance abuse yeah, that's a whole issue or a mental health issue. Do you think that people who are houseless with HIV, AIDS, do you think they're aware of their illness or do you think that a lot of them are just completely unaware? It's unknown. The thing is, is that we believe about one in seven people living with HIV don't know that they have it. So if you put that statistic to the houseless population, I would imagine it's pretty consistent and maybe more so. This is just me anecdotally guessing, but I'm guessing that that number is going to be higher because they're less likely to be getting regular blood work. They're less likely right. to be taking care of themselves at a level where if they're experiencing some kind of symptom, you know, when, when you are hungry, when you are cold, when you're dealing with other illnesses, people who are houseless have a greater chance of having lots of other diseases occur as well. They might be associating that with other things that are going on. Grief can be isolating and community is essential to explore, survive, and heal with grief. I co-facilitate the Pause, Breathe, Restore retreats, where we help people engage and move forward with grief in a safe, supportive, and healing community. Our next grief retreat will be held at the Oregon Coast March 5th through 8th. Information about this retreat can be found at pausebreatherestore.com and in our show notes. You have a daughter, <laughs> <laughs> which is so awesome. I think about that grief that you had that was associated with your diagnosis when you thought you wouldn't have a family at all or even a partner, a life partner, but you have a life partner mm -hmm. and you have a teenager. Wow. I know. It's so incredible. And I think about just the miracle of being able to do that. It is something that I look at almost every, every day. I look at her with this wonderment of, wow, she's here. I have this gift of being a mother, this gift of stewarding this other life and doing the best that I can as she becomes, as she grows into herself. And it's just magic. But it, when you said those words, you have a daughter, my laughter is just like that joyful acknowledgement. Yes. Wow. I have a daughter. It was not a possibility at the time I was diagnosed for two reasons. There was a pretty high chance of transmittal if I were to become pregnant and, and give birth at that time. I was also given a very short life expectancy. I couldn't possibly imagine bringing a child into this world and knowing that I would be exiting and leaving that kiddo behind. It wasn't something I could conscience. Yeah. So it was out. I was barren. I was coming to terms with the fact that I would never parent. And I knew I wanted to be a mother. I'm an innate caretaker. And I didn't know if I would give birth. I didn't know if I would adopt. But I knew that as an adult, one of my main roles in life would be to be mother. Mm. I'm so glad you get to be a mother. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> and I also imagine, because people can be really awful, unfortunately, mm. how was the balance between those that were supportive and those... I can even imagine even those who were supportive of you were, were supportive, but questioning if this was a good idea. 
Yeah. What, what did you, I mean, what was the spectrum of what you encountered? I generally had a good support network amongst friends. And I have a great privilege to live in a city with a lot of informed people. And I do realize that my disclosed HIV status is a privilege that I live with. I could not live like this in many other parts of the world. I actually recently did some work overseas and realized, had a bit of a reality check that if I lived in that country, I wouldn't be disclosing as easily as I do in my, my city with my circle of friends. So while I had a lot of support from friends, I experienced things I never would have expected in the search for an OBGYN because I got lots of referrals. I even experienced sitting down with someone who offered me a late stage abortion because I was putting that life at risk. And that was wow. devastating. Because I was still very public with my activism and did appear with my huge pregnant belly on the cover of a magazine, I received so much criticism for that. People talking about me thinking only about myself, that I was putting another life at risk. And it was very hard to be under so much scrutiny. It was very hard to be in a position where I made an informed decision. And it was actually belated. Years prior to my decision to get pregnant, we knew that we were at a point where it was less than a 1% chance of transmission for a mother who had HIV under control with medications to transmit it to their child. And I was taking the exact same risk that any woman my age was taking with becoming pregnant. And the way that I qualified that was that I knew that I also had a less than 1% chance of having a baby with Down syndrome. And yeah. that is a serious consideration as well. So to be taking the same risk in my mind as many other mothers were taking at that time, I felt that I had a right as much as any other woman to have a pregnancy. And yet it was very hard to be in the public eye, to receive those criticisms and to sit with, did I do the right thing? And to walk through those early days of her life and those months of waiting for the tests to come back oh, yeah. that truly determined that she indeed was HIV free. How long did you have to wait for those tests? We pretty much knew by the time she was four months old. Oh, but imagine having a tiny, tiny newborn and they're trying to find a vein in her skull to draw enough mm. blood to make an assay to check whether or not she has HIV and doing it again when she's three months old. It was hard. There were there were moments of should I have done this? What am I doing? There wasn't any support, really. I was a bit solitary in that experience and I got through it with support of friends with an amazing OBGYN. While I went through times of questioning and really had to check myself at times, did I do the right thing? Am I and my partner making the right decision to move forward with this? I knew the statistics. I knew that I was likely doing the right thing. It was just really hard to have that constant questioning and to not be sure. This was pretty much before social media took off, right? True. So this how was did, 2006. So how did people reach you? The types of criticism I received during my pregnancy, being an HIV positive woman, were really public. I received them mostly in the form of blogs, public blogs that people wrote. And would they call you out? Oh, absolutely. <sighs> I, I was called out and compared to other people that one would vilify. I was called names. I was told that I really was doing something wrong. And there were also forwarded emails through the press at the time. I'm not sure why. I, I also got forwarded amazing support. I mean, unfortunately, we hear the criticism louder a lot of the time. I think that's the unfortunate way of the world. And the fact was that I also received a lot of incredible support from oh. absolute strangers. So I tried to hold on to that. And I, I think that kind of speaks to my nature. I generally 
try to go toward the light and look toward the good. And I really do believe people are good at heart. I believe in that. And I've trusted that my entire life because it does bear out. It's just that there are a lot of things blinding people to how I think we really are at our nature. And especially now, we, we have a lot of distractions. Yeah, we sure do, don't we? But yeah, that, in, that, <laughs> in that time before social media, the, the negative messaging was either through the press, blogs, which were the early, and direct emails. Something we don't always talk about with grief is how financially vulnerable we can be. That's why it's important to have someone on your team that you can trust. My financial planner, Leslie Tyzak at Edward Jones, is that person. She looks at what is important to me when helping with everything from managing budgets, cash flow, and where to invest and save. I got to know her when I was setting up my kids' college savings accounts. She is someone I can count on to help me and my kids optimize our resources to make the best choices when it comes to preparing for our futures. Schedule a meeting with Leslie to talk about your goals. Her contact info is in the show notes. I think something that is huge that informs my parenting is that I've faced my own death. I've faced my mortality. And not just once, a couple of times. And it causes me to be very deep, I suppose, in everything that we do. I tend not to have a lot of superficiality. Maybe that is to a fault sometimes. I have to be brought back to that lightness. And kids help you do that which is amazing. <laughs> but I'm thinking, can you really even be superficial with your kids? I would say that I'm not the fun mom. I am definitely the <laughs> very philosophical, deep thinking, wise mom. I'm more like your grandma mom <laughs> than, than the fun mom. And I own that. I think that my experience has also caused me to try to look at her perspective as often as possible. I remember that sense of invulnerability. I remember what it was like in that time to feel devastated by a choice that I made and really try to, as I'm guiding this young person, remember that she's going to make mistakes. Remember that she's also going to be crushed at some point by a choice that she makes. And that is part and parcel of youth and becoming. And I'm ready for that. I'm happy to be here as that support. But my experience has also given me windows into things that I don't want to see. I am challenged as a parent who is an abuse survivor to remember that my daughter's having a very different experience than I had and to support her and try not to have the experiences that I had temper how I would parent. You know, there are instincts in me to be more protective or if a conversation occurs where I'm suspicious about what was talked about, I hold myself back. It's hard knowing those things are possible as a parent. I think that if you haven't gone through trauma, haven't gone through violation, you're not going to have that in your context as you consider the risks that your child is engaging. It might make things a little easier. For me, I'm constantly aware of what could occur, and that is a hard thing to walk with as a parent. So you had some tough things happen in your childhood. Yes. Have you thought that there could be a correlation between having this instability in your childhood and trauma in your childhood somehow correlate to what happened with you becoming HIV positive? It is a very good question because actually a very high percentage of us living with HIV have a trauma background. An unfortunately high percentage of us have experienced some form of partner violence, domestic violence, or other trauma. And it does inform one's boundaries. It informs one's decision making. And I can absolutely say that while I can't ascribe having become infected to that childhood experience, I definitely didn't have some of the tools that would have protected me, would have helped me make better choices. And I can say that as a parent now, I'm making sure that my daughter has some of those tools. She's enjoyed taking self-defense classes. 
She is very aware. She has wonderful boundaries. And I love when I hear her say no. <laughs> and I love it when she's expressing what she needs for her to feel comfortable. Those are things that I wasn't allowed at her age. And I know that it might have informed the type of choices and situations I put myself in. It is really beautiful seeing our children so easily advocate for themselves when it seems like I, in my advanced years, am only just now being able to do for myself. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yes, my kids are going to be saved all this. I mean, the ability to set those boundaries now and, and to advocate that, yes, my feelings matter. And yes, I, I deserve to be heard. And it's okay to share this. It's incredible. It's wonderful. And it is entirely different in many ways. Not only, you know, I'm, I'm speaking from having had a traumatic experience as a child, but we also were raised in the before times. I mean, I, I'm thinking, you know, a childhood in the 70s and 80s was a very different childhood than today where things are much more about the child. The child being considered in decisions, the child's welfare. It used to be that the child was seen but not heard kind of a thing. Yeah. You know, the, the kid was secondary. It was really about the parents. I talked to a lot of parents who struggle with that because that's, regardless of how awesome their intentions are, the innate an unintentional pull towards behaving as they did as, as they were treated as children can surprise. And a lot of parents struggle with that, the whole being seen and not heard. And now we have these wonderful things called electronic devices uh, that kind of take care of that problem. Yeah. And I, I know I bring a lot of grief onto myself by having no screen time, no screen time, which makes me the evil person in the house. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just so stressful because it's a constant fight. Well, it's also stressful in other ways. And I've got a new way that I didn't expect, which is that we have accomplished really reduced screen time with our daughter. Mm -hmm. It means that she relates differently with her peers because her peers' screen time is through the roof. She's the one who wants to hang out with her friends without a phone. And they want to sit with her next to her on their phones. And so she's navigating a whole different thing, which is we've been successful as parents keeping her off the screen. Now, how do we help her relate to her friends who are on those screens? Right. Oh, my gosh. This is just so I didn't loaded. even expect that. <laughs> we're, I think, relating to each other in very different ways. And one of the things I see with HIV, with sexually transmitted infections, that's so important is communication. When kids have too much screen time, their ability to communicate, their ability to interact and socialize is reduced so heavily. And it's so important that we have that very precious human skill of making eye contact, checking in with each other. Right. You know, so much about intimacy is consent and what one is comfortable with for them to successfully become adults and be sex positive adults where that is an experience that is positive for them, it's going to require communication and it's going to require a lot of checking in with that potential future partner. And I get very concerned about what's happening in that way with young people because we do need to keep up communication. And I imagine in your own relationship, communication is huge. Yes. <laughs> and I've spent much of that relationship not with this idea of you equals you, the you know, undetectable means untransmittable. A large part of my relationship, I was virulent. I was someone who could infect someone. I worried about if I saw blood when I flossed my teeth. I worried if I had a cut. It was a very hard way to be with another person as a partner, to balance feeling like I could infect that person, but also Enjoy intimacy. Yes. And we were very, very cautious, um, surgical even. <laughs> and, and that took away a lot of spontaneity, for sure. I'm maybe a bit more of a rules person than other people. I've definitely compared notes with other what we call zero diverse partners, where the one partner is HIV positive and the other is HIV negative. 
meaning one zero positive, one zero yeah. negative. In other partners, uh, people have been more lax and been okay with more risk. And we just never were. We really 100% of the time made our efforts to be safer. And even when we conceived our daughter, it was through artificial home insemination. But even knowing that you can't infect someone, mm -hmm. now that you know that for sure, has that changed? Slowly. Yeah. Hard to undo habits. We're, we are creatures of habit, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> and I think we all have read many an article about how long it takes to undo habits that we have formed. And I just have this intrinsic habit of certain ways of protecting my partner when intimate. And it's going to take time for me to completely change to feeling, feeling that I'm not violent, feeling that I'm okay to be around in, in all ways. And that my intimacy is something that I don't have to be cautious about at every turn. And that extends to stigma. Stigma can be the thing that is one of the biggest obstacles for people with HIV to getting care, disclosure. And there's a lot of self-stigma still for me that mm -hmm. I hold. And I, I do think that I still self-stigmatize based on some of those early perceptions that are still so ingrained. And that extends to some of the general population. I'm still surprised by how often I have a conversation with someone who doesn't understand that an HIV positive mother with medications can have a healthy baby. It's just not known. And it seems like such a simple piece of information, and it seems like it's been in the public conversation for a long time, but there's still stigma due to that ignorance. I'm just thinking about this incredible, incredible life you have lived and are living. What most fills you with gratitude as you have beat your diagnosis, as, you, as you've gotten your family that you always wanted? Oh, where do you sit with all of this and in looking into the future? For me, gratitude comes from very small things. The interaction with a friend, you know, sharing a, a cup of tea or, you know, getting to catch up with a girlfriend after a long time of not seeing each other, which tends to be the case in my life. <laughs> uh, part of being an activist and being a creative person in my work means that I do work quite a bit. But the gratitude comes in the form of really seeing these gifts every day. I think that that is perhaps the gift of all of this experience. Having nearly lost my life at a couple of turns, it helped me be in this moment, be in the now, much more than I think a lot of people otherwise would be. And I look to my decisions in that I want to know that I lived today in a good way. Grief, Gratitude, and Greatness was created by me, Sarah Shaul, and is a production of Recursive Delete Audiovisual in Portland, Oregon. This episode was produced and edited by Jack Saturn, with music by Samantha Jensen. Subscribe to our show wherever you listen to podcasts. Word of mouth helps us find new listeners, so please leave us a review and let your friends know about us. More information about this episode and how to contact us can be found in our show notes and at griefgratitudegreatness.com. You'll also find links to follow us on Instagram, Patreon, and Facebook. Join us next time. We look forward to sharing more conversations with you.